The following program is made possible with support from the Alfred P. Sloan Foundation. Welcome to Science Goes to the Movies, a look at the stories of science and how they change our culture. I'm Faith Saley. And I'm Heather Berlin. Science Goes to the Movies is all about movies, TV shows, pop culture, and science. Today, we're going to talk about Doctor Who. Doctor Who is a British science fiction show that ran from 1963 to 1989. The show took a 20-year hiatus and then came roaring back in 2009 and has been growing stronger every year. The relationship between Doctor Who and the laws of physics is, in the words of Doctor Who himself, People assume that time is a strict progression of cause to effect, but actually, from a non-linear, non-subjective viewpoint, it's more like a big ball of wibbly-wobbly, timey-wimey stuff. That said, there are some elements of the fiction that line up very well with the weirdness of quantum physics. For instance, the Weeping Angels. These monsters first showed up in the 2007 season of Doctor Who in an episode called Blink. When observed, they freeze like a statue, but when unobserved, they can move vast distances. And if, God forbid, they touch you, you're hurled back in time, and the angels feast on your unlived days. We're so pleased to welcome to the show atomic physicist Mukund Venkalator, professor in the lab of atomic and solid state physics at Cornell University. Thank you for joining us. Thanks for having me. Not having seen the show, you wrote a paper about events on a quantum level that sort of behaves very much like Doctor Who's weeping angels. That's right. So please explain to me what kind of um, strange principle of quantum physics allowed you to lift from a fictional TV series that you had not yet seen? So quantum theory makes a lot of predictions uh, which run counter to our everyday uh, intuition of how the world works. Uh, so for instance, quantum theory says very curiously that a system cannot change as long as you're observing it, as long as you're measuring what the state of the system is. That was the particular concept that we were trying to elucidate and then use as a means of exerting control on a quantum system. Can we take a system that typically undergoes some kind of an evolution or behaves in a certain way, but then control that evolution merely by the act of measuring the system or observing the system? And so what parts of that paper could seem fictional to us lay people. If we took atoms and then made them really, really cold by shining lasers on them. And by extremely cold, I mean uh, about 10 nano Kelvin above, above absolute zero. Lasers can make things cold? Exactly, but it's another thing that runs counter to everyday intuition. Uh, yeah. But it does happen. And it makes them not just cold as an ice cold, but as cold as laws of physics allow them to exist. So you made them very cold, very and cold. then? And then we let them loose in, a, uh, in essentially a box. Now, as at such low temperatures, the atoms are indeed moving, but they're moving very, very slowly. But they are indeed moving. But what happens if we start observing them, if we start measuring their actual position? And turned out that, as quantum mechanics does indeed predict, as we start observing them or watching them more and more and more frequently, they freeze into place. Just like the angels exactly. in this episode. <laughs> exactly. And don't look behind you. Is it behind me too? Oh my gosh, okay. <laughs> don't blink. Um, why? Why? It has to do with this, one of the foundational or the fundamental concepts of quantum physics, which is this notion of wave-particle duality. Now, uh, we think of systems or particles or entities as being one of two things. Either they are waves, meaning they spread around, they are what we call delocalized. You can't ascribe a certain position to a wave. If I toss a pebble at a pond and these, I see these ripples spread out, uh, and I were to ask you, where is that ripple? You would say, well, it's in this large region. I ask you, where, where is it headed? You say it's headed all over the place, right? It's, it's coming out as a circle. So it does not have a particular location. It does not have a particular velocity. Ripples or waves can bend around corners. They can undergo interference. They can undergo diffraction. So these are wave-like properties. Tennis balls don't do that. 
you know, uh, if I were to hit a tennis ball and I were to tell you, well, it's really all over the place at the same time, that would make for a very interesting Wimbledon, but that's not what happens. Uh, it has a very specific velocity and a very specific direction. Quantum mechanics says that at the atomic level, at the nanoscale, both these very disparate properties can exist at the same time. And here's the even more curious part, whether, whether you see particle-like or wave-like properties depends on what experiment you're trying to do. If you are looking for wave-like properties, you will find them. But if you're looking for particle-like properties, you will find them as well, but never at the same time. We live in a really open society. Why should it be so mind-blowing that things go both ways? <laughs> uh, for two reasons. One is we are talking about the same entity, which can behave in one of two very different ways. Uh, and these two concepts uh, are, we like to think of them as uh, two very, very different kinds of physics. Okay, it's not the case of a person who you know, likes soup and meals. Uh, that <laughs> is not strange. But to say that here's a particle that can, or here's an entity that can behave both as a particle, tennis balls moving back and forth, and as a wave, sound waves which can diffract around corners and so on, but at the same, at the same time, and more curiously, what it actually ends up doing depends on what you're looking for. You can get it to behave like a particle if you look for particle-like behavior, and you can take the same entity and then get it to behave like a wave if that's what you're looking for. That is rather curious. That I will grant you. That is very curious. But are these just abstracts? I mean, can we actually just build something on these principles? Are they meaningful? Absolutely. And in fact, it's, it's, uh, they are not abstract. They have shown themselves to work at levels of incredible precision. And they have given rise to a lot of very, very important and you know, revolutionary technology, like transistors, you know, the notion of computation, lasers. Uh, when people uh, actually, when scientists actually built the laser, uh, they were not thinking of barcode scanners in the supermarket. Uh, they were actually trying to uh, measure certain properties of individual atoms uh, with incredible precision to verify predictions of quantum theory. Uh, and that, in turn, as is often the case in science, what starts off as a very fundamental curiosity about the way nature works ends up creating a lot of applications uh, which the initial scientists who actually developed those models or developed those experiments had no way of knowing. And that's usually the way science works, that you know, uh, fundamental curiosity gives rise to technology, which then improves the sophistication of our experiments, which then gives rise to other technology, and so on and so forth. It's so cool. It's so it cool. Is. I think people like you and, mm -hmm. and me, who aren't physicists, just find what you do so cool. Actually, after we published this paper, which to us was, in a sense, very interesting, at the same time, a, uh, you know, a confirmation of what quantum mechanics does indeed predict about the importance of measurement. To, to us, that was a very nice experiment, and my students worked very hard to get that to work. Uh, but the public attention caught us by surprise. So maybe I can ask you, uh, why do you think this is cool? I, well, I mean, at least in the world that I'm in, the in in understanding mysterious things like consciousness and that kind of thing, um, the idea of indeterminacy, the idea that the, you know it's not possible to really know for sure, um, you know what a system is, or what particles are doing, leaves room for something magical to happen, I and I think that's why people really grasp on to these sort of when you get really into quantum mechanics and there becomes this aspect of almost mysticism. Mm -hmm. People get really excited about that because not everything is determined not everything is materialistic right. you know even though it is in a way yes. it leaves a little bit of room for some uncertainty yes and, and and a lot of times people equate that with maybe that's how consciousness exists you know maybe there's something to do with the quantum world that links the physical brain to the mind and there's something magical going on and so there's spooky stuff over here there's spooky stuff over here they must be related right. and that's not necessarily true but it's I think it's why people get excited I see Doctor Who is all about time travel, and one of the fundamental claims of the theory of quantum mechanics states that in the world of subatomic particles, time runs backward as well as forward. Mukund, how? Why? What? Is Again, this true? The short answer is yes, it does seem to happen, or yes, it, that's the way it seems to work. And uh, why? I don't know. 
it is another thing that we believe uh, comes about as an emergent property as you take systems and make them more and more complex. Whereas at yeah. this microscopic level, at the level of a single atom, whether you run the equations forward in time or backward in time, it's symmetric. Doctor Who's TARDIS is clearly fiction, but as a scientist, do you think time travel is possible? At the tiny level, it's not only possible, but we know it happens. But could you actually say that maybe, I mean, time doesn't really exist? Exactly. Time, I, very much the current understanding, and this is again very much topics of current research, is that time, uh, like many other large macroscopic classical properties, is emergent. Is that to say it doesn't exist? I thought I, one of Einstein's the, amazing breakthroughs was that it's relative. It's relative, uh, and uh, the classic quantum physics answer is it is undefined. It does not make, ra rather than say we don't know the answer, uh, the way quantum physics has, in a sense, swept these uh, uh, questions under the carpet is to say, don't bother asking. But also, we, the way we perceive time, I did some experiments with, with people on, on time perception and how we understand time, and it's very subjective as well. So that our perception of time can either be faster or slower depending on sure. a million different things and also we're tying it to what parts of your brain are involved in your perception of time and we can even uh, stimulate your brain with with magnets and m move your perception of time around and dilate it or constrict it so it's such a malleable kind of construct that we I feel as if you know we've created but wait I, I'm just gonna I just really gotta know I mean time like do you think time travel is possible in the way that you know someday possible in the way that maybe Doctor Who does it? For large macroscopic objects, I would doubt it. <sighs> All right. Sorry, but, but it's another very fascinating uh, aspect of quantum theory that at the level of single atoms, we know it happens. And I, I can give you a very uh, uh, easy to understand example uh, of the, the, uh, uh, why this is confusing. Because for instance, if I were to put a single drop of milk in my cup of coffee, and I look at it then and there, then you can clearly see that there's a spot of white in the coffee. If I come back the next day, it's going to be, the, the coffee is going to have, you know, the milk is going to have completely mixed in. But there's nothing in the laws of physics, really, that says that a drop of milk here has to go and find another spot. It is as likely for, for a little quantum of milk to go to from a spot here to there, as it is likely for the same quantum of same kind of molecule of milk to go the other way around. There is nothing in quantum theory that says you only have to go this way. It's only that when you put in a lot of these molecules, and then you say, on average, what happens? And then you realize that there are many more paths for the milk molecules to go out than it is likely for all these molecules once spread to come back in. And so then you ascribe a direction to time saying, clearly the mixed situation happened later than the single drop situation. And so I'm going to f define the direction of time to be this way. I see. But if you look at any particular molecule of milk and you say, did this molecule just head straight, straight to this point? No, it's just as likely for, that, for the other opposite thing to happen. So, so from it, your point of view, uh, our way of ascribing time is a way to understand a sequence of events, but, but it's more, not inexorable. It's not... Exactly. Yeah. You're saying on average, do things get more disordered? Do, do things get more messy? Well, that's the direction of time. That's the second law of thermodynamics, right? That's absolutely right. But I think what you're saying is that ultimately time travel is possible if we can break ourselves down to the molecular or the, the yes. quantum level. We and we can tr you down. translate each one of those little pieces. Well, time travel is happening. At that level? Can. Absolutely, yeah. all the time. In Doctor Who, an action taken at one end of the universe can affect life in other parts of the universe, even when separated by great expanses of time and space. In real life, Albert Einstein rejected that very idea. Einstein preferred the principle of locality, which states that an object is directly influenced only by its immediate surroundings. But earlier this year at Delft University in the Netherlands, scientists reported that they had conducted an experiment that proves objects separated by great distances can instantaneously affect others' behavior.
So, Makun, will you please sort this out for us? Um, who is right, Albert Einstein or Doctor Who? <laughs> In this particular case, turns out Einstein was wrong. And the concept he was talking about, this notion of spooky action at a distance, is something we refer to as entanglement. That two entities, like two spins or two photons, uh, can be, in a sense, entangled. That, and they can indeed, after they are entangled, they can indeed be taken to very remote locations. And the properties of one are intimately connected to the properties of the other, so that if you measure a certain property of this system here, then it does indeed affect the property of its partner, so even though they're very, very far apart. So to produce this spooky action at a distance, which is something Einstein said as, as in a derogatory exactly. way, right? And which exactly. turned out to be true. To produce spooky action at a distance, you're saying that the particles have had to be entangled ahead of time? Exactly. That's so romantic. It is, yes. Uh, the, uh, the, uh, the point is, the, uh, you know, once you entangle them, the real uh, or the physicist's way of looking at it is that the collective system... It's conscious uncoupling, right? Wow, uh, I had never thought about that way. Anyway, go ahead. <laughs> yeah. uh, but it's what we say is we have, in a sense, complete information about the collective system. But the, we have very uh, uh, incomplete uh, information about the constituents of this collective system. So when we now take this collective system, having prepared this entanglement, and then take them far apart, we can only still have complete information on what the collective system is, but not on any individual constituent of the collective system. So for instance, if I were to prepare, to give this a very concrete example, which is also what was done in the Delft experiment, they created uh, two spins. Now you can think of these spins as you know, just uh, uh, bits, which can be zero or one, we call them up or down. And they ensured, all they had to do was to ensure that if one of them was up, the other had to be down. There were no exceptions. Now, that's a very simple situation to understand. But now you separate them, you don't know if this is up or down. But what you do know is if this is up, then this one had to be down, even if these two spins were at other ends of the opposite ends of the universe. And so what they did was to then measure, is this up? If this is up, is this down? Instantaneously. That's the crazy part, instantaneously. Yeah, but if, you, if I were to think about it as now, if I were to bring them back together and say, you know, one is up, the other is down. I'm not going to tell you which one's up, which one's down. Is that really so strange? And you would say, well, here's my complete set of information about the system. There are two particles, one is up, one is down not so spooky. <laughs> and I can give you a classical example and say, but this is not how quantum physics behaves. So that here's a classical example. Say you have two identical twins. They both take off at Heathrow. One goes to Tokyo, the other goes to New York. Let's call them Bill and Bob. Okay, you don't know which one went to New York, which one went to Tokyo. But if you meet the guy in Tokyo and say, well, that's Bob then in a sense you immediately know that the one who went to New York was Bill. Okay? That's a very classical example that does not sound very spooky because you say, well, I just had no way of knowing. But somebody out there, somebody in Heathrow clearly knew when they checked them into the, uh, to, to, their, uh, to their flight, they knew which one went to New York, which one went to New York. But so that's not so strange. Quantum mechanics does not behave that way. Quantum mechanics inherently, there is no way of knowing uh, uh, which one uh, went where, and the, uh, uh, you only have information about the collective system, but you cannot tell, uh, or let me rephrase that, quantum mechanics, uh, uh, the, exam the classical example I gave you is not the way quantum physics works. Quantum physics, in a sense, inherently is spooky. But the thing, I mean, this might sound simplistic, but I'm just sort of trying to wrap my mind around it, how these two things can be interacting at such great distances. And what, what doesn't seem strange to me is, is if I sort of, let's say, I don't know, you take two balls and you start them out and you spin one going in this direction and the other going in this direction. 
so they're in opposite directions. And then let's say, you know, there's no friction or anything, of so course. it's in constant motion no matter what. And then you separate them out across the universe. Yeah. You know, it's not strange for me to think that one's still going to go in this direction and that one's still going to go in the opposite direction without them necessarily having to have be interacting in some spook, interacting in some spooky way across those distances. So is it like that? It's it's a bit. Uh, it, it is it is a bit like that. The the uh, the the way we uh, kind of reconcile uh, uh, this notion of entanglement is to say, well, you only have information about the collective. And you might not have, you, you have very incomplete information about the constituents. But where, where does the change come in? Because that's, that's what makes it spooky, the, this, this part, right? When, when, if Bill became Bob, very good. that's the so, spooky right. part. And the way quantum physics really uh, uh, kind of tries to reconcile that or tries to get away from that uh, 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 kind of uh, 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 question is to say it does not make sense to ask which twin went to New York and which twin which twin went to uh, Tokyo until you actually measure their locations and measure their identity in the two cities. Bill's not Bill until he lands exactly. and is, and is determined to, measure, to be Bill. Exactly. Because it could be Bob. You never know. He exactly. could be anybody on that flight. <laughs> exactly. Okay, now we are going to play a wonderful game in which I get to ask you two questions. Ooh. Oh, where are they? Right here. <laughs> I've been sitting on these, you guys. Um, and you have to figure out the answers, okay? So our first question is to our brain girl, Heather, and it is about telepathy. Ooh. Can you read my mind? I know, and know what that the card answer says. Oops. Okay. Um, okay, there's a telepathic species in Doctor Who called the Ood. The Ood have two brains, one brain in their head, and a second brain they carry in their hand. This exterior brain allows them to be telepathic, okay? So the question is, do you think anyone will ever create an external thinking device that would allow us to be telepathic? Mm, I like that. It's kind of like our iPhones, right? That's our external brain. Uh, <laughs> no, actually, I think that's absolutely. Um, I don't think that telepathy will exist in the sense of, you know, the spooky magical power of you being able to read my thoughts, but via a device, yes. And so what's happening now in neuroscience is really exciting. Um, they're developing neuroprosthetics to help people, let's say, who are um, completely paralyzed or paraplegic and quadriplegic and can't move anything and can't even speak. You know, how can they communicate? And so we're developing these neural implants that you can actually record activity directly from cortex. And there are things called um, BCIs, like brain computer interface or BMIs, brain machine interface, where we directly connect the brain to a machine that's interpreting the signals. Um, and then it can say, for example, with your thought, you can type an email because you can decode information. Let's say you say, when you think about moving your hands to the left, your motor cortex will fire in a certain way. The machine, the computer will decode that and translate it as a cursor moving to the left or the right. Now, when you say, think about squeezing your hand, that will translate via the computer to a mouse clicking. So now you can imagine a screen with all letters on it. And by thinking move left, move right, now click by thinking about squeezing your hand, that all that decoded information, you can literally spell out a message by your thoughts. Now, it's not 100% perfect, but it's getting very, very good. And now, but it's invasive. You have to actually put these implants on, you know, on the cortex. They're starting to do things where they have grids, where you can implant an entire grid that's picking up a lot of information, um, which is slightly less invasive. But the real question is, can we get to a point as well where we can do something outside of the skull so it's not invasive like EEG? I mean, right now EEG is not, we don't have the kind of clarity that we need to be able to do this at this point in time, although some people are claiming, but it's very, very primitive. But ultimately, if we can do something that's outside Side the skull that can translate neural activity and then translate it to your brain and in you know implant that information. Now we can start to do things like that in rats already. So I see no reason why ultimately you know in due course we will be able to do that and translate translate messages between people just by using our thoughts and machines. That's amazing and terrifying. Well, Heather, Dr. Heather Berlin, I would say you got that question okay. right. right. Mukund, are you ready? You yep. look very, very nervous. I'm, I'm okay. terrified. Uh, Doctor Who has a sonic screwdriver that he uses mostly to open doors, but occasionally to repair things. Never as a weapon. As scientists, you know that every structure has its own resonant frequency, and if an external source of vibrations matches this frequency, it will cause the object to violently shake, and that shaking could cause damage. So... McCoond. We know that in reality, a tool such as Doctor Who's sonic screwdriver could easily be destructive. 
but can messing with an object's frequency ever really repair something? I would think so. And uh, I can give you one particular example of taking a uh, uh, material or a substance with a lot of defects in it and then exciting it at certain frequencies to get these defects to, in a sense, fill in or, or you know, kind of repair itself. Uh, All right, let me see if you're right. Yes, you're right. McCone <laughs> is right. Yay, science. <laughs> um, one last very important thing before we go, Makund, um, I noticed on your Rate My Professor page that you have a big red chili pepper under the hotness category um, in oh. student <laughs> evaluation. We do our research okay. here. Uh, what's that all about, Makund? I wish I knew. Oh, come on. <laughs> Don't be coy with me. I think it has to do with the fact that I give out very easy A's or none. I don't Is that a euphemism? <laughs> no, no. I'm just kidding. Listen, everybody. I have no idea. Actually, Cornell that, gives that's out the first EGA's I actually saw about it. I don't know. As far as rating our guests, you get you get yeah. a chili pepper. Two chili peppers. Oh, look. Spooky Thank action you. at a distance, oh. but, we're, but we're agreeing. Thank you very um, much. In another universe, we would have time to continue this conversation, but that's all we have time for today. We're so happy you dropped by. Thank Thanks you. Thanks for having me. Thanks for being here. And don't forget to check us out on the web at cuny.tv under the Science tab, where you'll find past shows, additional content, and a link to our app.